All right, let's go ahead and begin today. So uh, by Thursday, after the lecture on Thursday, uh, you'll be able to build, you know, model your first uh, digital device in um, System Bearer Lock, a device called a Ripple uh, Carry Adder. So today we're going to talk about some of the uh, topics that you need in order to understand, you know, what a Ripple Carry Adder is. And the agenda is up here. We're going to talk about two gates that we haven't talked about yet, the exclusive OR and exclusive NOR. So on each table, I put the handout that has the logic gates along with um, the two tables and the Boolean identities. It's like I have for uh, a couple of the previous lectures. So remember, we've already talked about a NOT gate, right? The output's always the opposite input. And we talked about an AND gate, where we get a one out when all the inputs are one. An OR gate, where you get a one out as long as at least one of the inputs is a one. And then the NAND and the NOR, right? Which again, NAND is not AND. So if you compare the true table of an AND gate to an AND gate, it's just the output's inverse. And then also the NOR, which is not OR. And again, the truth tables, if you look at them, it's just the NOR has an inverted output compared to the, the OR. So those five gates, those are what are considered the basic gates. And then the exclusive OR and exclusive NOR, they're not considered basic gates. They're actually called compound gates. And that's because you can make an exclusive OR out of the basic gates. In fact, I think it's like an AND gate, a NAND gate, and an OR gate, like three gates connected up in a certain way that gives you uh, the exclusive OR. I mean, if you just Google exclusive OR, you'll probably find somewhere where it shows the actual logic circuit that makes up an exclusive OR. And it's the same sort of thing with an exclusive NOR. You know, just three gates or three of the basic gates make up uh, the exclusive OR. So we're gonna talk about uh, those two gates and then uh, that will lead us into uh, bit addition, okay? Um, and then bit addition um, has what we call a half adder that we'll talk about. And that's actually part of the activity and also lab two. And then multi-bit addition, will, which will lead us into a full adder, which is also another part of the activity today in lab two. So after all of this, then you can work on the activity and then start into a lab. Again, remember for the activity, get credit, you do have to be physically present. So, you know, don't leave. If you want to get credit for the activity, don't leave until your table passes in, uh, you know, the work. Okay, then for the lab portion, okay, if, if you don't want to stay in the room, you want to go elsewhere to work on it, or work on it later, then that's perfectly okay. okay but the activity, you got to be in the room. And the lecture will probably not be as long as uh, some of the other lectures have been, okay? All right, so let's start with uh, the exclusive OR. This is the logic symbol for an exclusive OR. So what does it look a lot like? What other logic symbol? Oh, yeah, an OR gate. In fact, it's just the OR gate symbol with this added, I call it a spoiler, you know, right here on the uh, input side. And the truth table for an exclusive OR is that you only get a one out of an exclusive OR when the inputs are different. When the inputs are the same, you get a zero out. So this is a different truth table. If you were to compare this truth table to the previous truth tables, like what's on that handout, and also the NAND and the NOR that we talked about that's not on that handout, you would see that this is different than all those others. So that's what makes it a unique gate and you know, gives it its own symbol. Now the Boolean algebra for an exclusive OR, okay, just looking at the truth table here, and if I write a Boolean expression for F, I just write the inputs where F is equal to one. Well, F would just be not A, B, or A, not B, right? Just like we've done before when we've written expressions from the truth table, wherever there's a zero, that's the not term, wherever there's a one, it's just the variable. Now, there's a shorthand notation for exclusive or. So instead of writing this, I can also write this and it's the same. 
and that's A, and then a plus with a circle around it, B. In Boolean algebra, that symbol, the plus with a circle, that means exclusive board. So I would say A, exclusive board with B. Okay, so this is shorthand for this. They mean the same thing. And then in system Verilog, system Verilog, the exclusive or symbol is the carrot. So in system Verilog, if you were going to type in this, um, this expression here, you would say, or you would type assign F equals A and the carrot. I think that's the symbol above the six on the keyboard. And then B, and then you need a semicolon to in, in the line. Okay? So do you have any questions about the exclusive or? All right, well, as you may guess, there's also an exclusive nor, right? Just like we have an or gate and a nor gate, there is an exclusive or and there's an exclusive nor. And how do you think the output of an exclusive nor is going to relate to the output of an exclusive or? Inverted. Yeah, it's just going to be inverted. See, <clears throat> in fact, the exclusive nor symbol has a little bubble on the output, just like the nor gate does to indicate that the output's inverted. So the exclusive nor, you'll get a one out when the inputs are the same, you'll get a zero out when the inputs are different. Okay, it's just the opposite of the exclusive or. And then the Boolean expression would look like this. I have not A, not B, or A, B. And then the shorthand would be A, exclusive or with B, the whole thing not it. You know, and if you did this in system Verilog, you know, you'd have to put the A caret B in parentheses and then put a little tilde up for the inversion outside of parentheses, just like you do with the NOR, you know, similar to what you do with the NOR gate in uh, Verilog. Okay, so, so any questions about either one of these gates? Okay, the next thing to look at is an example of a K-map where knowing the exclusive or and the exclusive nor is going to be useful. Okay, so let's look at this k-map here. And, you know, let's say I want to write an expression for f. So I'm interested in the ones. Can I group these ones in groups of two? Can I do di diagonal groups in a k-map? Like, could I do a group like this or a group like this or a group like that? No, 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 no. Why not? What only? What are the only shapes allowed in K maps? Yeah, it's got to be a square or a rectangle. It can't be like a diagonal. Okay, so we wouldn't be able to group any of these ones. Okay, they'd just be single groups. So I would just have four single groups, which means I'm going to get four terms where each term has three variables. Right, so F here from this uh, cell, I'm going to get not A, not B, not C, right? Because I'm just writing a zero for the Boolean expression, right? Where all the nots, we have all not variables. And then here I would get not A, B, C. And then for cell five, I would get A not B, C, and then for cell six, I would get A, B, not C. Okay. And so everybody see how I got that, right? We're just using what we've done before, nothing new. But what's new here is that now we can actually do further reduction. Okay? And this is using the laws or some of the laws that are on that handout that in base two algebra, you can factor out a like 
variable, just like you can in base 10. So right here, I could factor out the not A. So I could write this as not A, and then in parentheses, not B, not C, or B, C. And then I can factor out the A here, in these two terms, and I can get A, not B, C, or B, not C. All right, so just, you know, very similar or exactly the same um, that you do in base 10. Now, once we have it factored, look inside the parentheses here where I have not B, not C, or B, C. What logic function is that? Yeah, that's exclusive nor, right? It's right here, but with different variables. So I can write this as not a, and then here in the parentheses, I could put B, exclusive word with C, the whole thing inverted, right? I'm just using this right here. Okay, everybody good with that? Okay, if you're good with that, what's this here? That's exclusive or, right? Exclusive or with B and C. So I can write this as A, B, exclusive or with C. And I can even go further, right? Because now, if I let, you know, using a dummy variable, and this next step isn't necessary. I'm just doing it because for some people, it makes it clearer, okay? But perhaps you don't need to do this. But we could, uh, you know, define a dummy variable, let's say like X, and I could set X to B exclusive or C, right? And then I can substitute in the X here and I can write this as F equal not A X or not X or A X, right? I'm just substituting X in for B exclusive board with C. And now if you look at the relationship with A and X, what do we have here? Exclusive nor, right? So now I can write this as F equals A exclusive board X, the whole thing inverted. And then I can put in X. I just put in B exclusive toward C for X and I get A exclusive or Now I'm going to put parentheses, but you don't have to. So I won't put the parentheses. We'll just put it B exclusive toward C and then the whole thing. Like you could put parentheses here and it doesn't change anything. You can also put this in different order. Order doesn't matter. It's just like in, in base 10. Okay, but you see, this is what we can end up with for our most reduced expression. Um, this is what I was referring to. I don't know if you remember, but there was a KMAP problem we had back, you know, last week where I think it came out like B, C, or not B, not C. And I said, oh, we could go one step further, you know, but you're not ready for it. Well, that's what I was talking about. That was actually an exclusive nor. We kind of went, you know, one step further. Okay. And you see, anytime you have a KMAP, where you have single groupings that are diagonal from each other, there's a good chance you can do this. Now, I don't know if that's always true, but I can tell you most of the time when you have something like this, again, single groupings that are diagonal, you can probably do reduction with exclusive or exclusive norm. In fact, one part of the activity and also one part of lab two, you're gonna have a case like this. It's not gonna be the same, but it's gonna be very similar. Okay. All right. So, any questions up to this point? Right. Because, like I said, you're going to have to do this for the activity and also lab two. So, you can handle something like this. Okay. Good. All right. Well, let's move on now to bit addition. Okay. So, just like you add base 10 numbers, you can add base two numbers. You can add binary. And these are the rules where I'm about to fill this out. Um, when I have this filled out, 
these will be the rules of binary bit addition, a okay, single bit addition. So if you're adding bit zero to bit zero, it's just zero. Uh, a bit zero to bit one, it's just one. Adding one to zero, is just one. And then of course, one plus one is two. And how do you write two in binary? How do you write two in binary? One zero. One zero. Very good. So, you know, next time you talk to your uh, parents or, you know, whoever else is uh, like paying for your tuition, if there is someone paying for your tuition, you can tell them that in your third quarter freshman level college class, you learn zero plus zero, zero plus one, one plus one, and one plus zero. They'll be so proud. <laughs> okay, but the next thing we're going to do is um, we're going to take these rules of bit addition and put it into a truth table. Right? And the reason we're going to put these rules into a truth table is because once you have a truth table, you can get a logic circuit from it. Right? I mean, that was, I don't know, we talked about that the second class, I think, right? That, you know, you can put any sort of problem, like we put that, uh, you know, chip, egg, salsa, um, appetite of mine into a truth table, right? We were able to get a logic circuit for my appetite for those three ingredients, right? Well, if you can put something into a truth table, you can get a logic circuit from it, okay? So that's what we're gonna do here. And the way we're gonna do it is, I'm gonna define a variable A for these top row bits, and I'm going to find another variable B for this row of bits. And then where my result is, this furthest to the right bit of the result. Remember, bits that are, the bit that is furthest to the right, we always call that the least significant bit. Okay, LSG, least significant bit. And the bit furthest to the left, we call the most significant bit, okay, MSG. So I'm gonna call the least significant bit of the results S. Kind of do that. This is S, S, S. Okay, and then, the bit to the left of this least significant bit, we're going to label C. Now, it's not absolutely necessary to put the zeros here because, as you know, it doesn't change anything, but I'm going to put them here just to emphasize that for these um, additions here, this is also the C bit. Okay, so I'm just labeling my input bits and my resultant bits. Um, these bits here that we're adding, you know, those are inputs. And these bits that are the result, those are outputs. Because remember, when you make a truth table, on the left side of the truth table, you put your inputs. On the right side of the truth table, you put your outputs. So we're going to have A and B here on the left side. And we're going to have C and S here on the right side. Okay, so I think this is the first time you've seen a truth table that has more than one output, right? I think all the other truth tables we had just had a single output, if I remember right. Um, but you can have more than one output. I mean, many times you'll have truth tables that have, you know, lots of outputs. Okay, there's no limitation how many outputs you can have. No limitation how many inputs you can have either. Okay. Okay, so... Uh, now I'm just going to put these rules into the truth table. So when A and B are both zero, right, doing this right here, um, C is zero, S is zero. Uh, when A is zero and B is one, right, I'm looking at this rule here, uh, C is zero, S is one. When A is one and B is zero, C is zero, S is one. And when both inputs are one, well then my C is one and my S is zero. Okay, so I'm just translating those rules into the truth table. And now I can write an expression for both of these outputs. And I could even do a K map if I wanted to. I mean, we've seen eight cell K maps and 16 cell K maps. There are four cell K maps. But usually when you have a truth table that's only four rows, usually you don't write a k-map. 
because all you have to do to get the expression is look at each output separately as that output compares to the input to get what kind of data it is or what kind of logic are you using. So if we were to ignore the S output and just look at the C output compared to our inputs, what kind of gate is that? Yeah, it's AND, right? Because the C output is a one only when both inputs are one. Otherwise, it's a zero. That's an AND gate. Okay, how about if you just look at the S output compared to these inputs? All right, that's one we just talked about earlier, right? That's an exclusive OR. Okay, so, you know, you don't have to do a K-map if it's just four rows. But if you wanted to do a K-map, a four cell K map looks like this. It's just four cells. This is the zero cell. This is the one cell. This is the two. This is the three. This would be the A row. This would be the B column. Okay. But like I said, usually you don't deal with four cell K maps. You know, when you do a K map, it's either eight cell or 16 cell. Um, any higher cell than 16 cell, you're probably just going to use a computer program. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think in. Um, well, I don't know if the class is taught anymore to tell you the truth, because the professor who used to teach it was a very specialized class. She's no longer here. But there was like an elective class that I think there was an instructor that used to do K maps more than uh, 16 cells. But I think she just used the computer program for it. Okay. So the logic circuit that gives you this truth table and therefore performs these rules, is called a half adder. And you're gonna build a half adder in uh, System Verilog. And one of the things you're asked to do in the activity is a black box diagram for a half adder. So, What's the main purpose of a black box diagram? Like, what does it tell you when you look at a black box diagram? Yeah, it just it just tells you the inputs and outputs for whatever that device is, right? So for your half adder, you're gonna have two inputs and you're gonna have two outputs. And then also your black box diagram has the name of whatever the black box represents. So you know, you can just name it half adder or HA or something like that, okay? But yeah, black box diagrams, they'll just have a name, you know, a descriptive name, and then they just have what the inputs and outputs are for that device or circuit, whatever it may be, whatever that black box diagram is represented, okay? Okay, the next thing is, usually, if you're doing any sort of, like, useful addition, in base two, you're adding multiple bit binary numbers. Like usually just to add single bits is not all together that useful. What's more useful, what's more common is adding something like this, where you're adding two multiple bit binary numbers. Like say these two four bit binary numbers. And, you know, let's say, this is the ones column to these bits, you know, and this is the twos column, the fours, and the eights. Okay, so what would this binary number be in base 10? Zero, one, one, zero in binary is what in base 10? Six, right? So we got a four, we got a two, so that's six. Okay, and how about this binary number? What is it in base 10? Seven. So you see here we're adding six plus seven in binary. And when you add multi-bit binary numbers manually, you add the bits column by column. Okay, it, It's just like adding two base 10 numbers, right? You start with the least significant digit, right? We call characters in base 10 digits, digits, and you just work your way to the left. It's, it's no different in base two. Okay, so you see we would start here, with the least significant bit column, and zero plus one is one without a carry, and then one plus one is zero with a carry, and then I get to this bit column and I'm adding three ones. Now, when you add three ones, what do you get? 
Right, you get one one in binary because three one to force is three, and one one um, is is three in binary, right? So, so you see that would be a one with a carry of one. Then here you're just adding one plus two zeros, which is just a one. So you see this comes out a thirteen, so you know makes sense. But the key point here is right here where we're adding three ones. The half adder cannot do that addition. The reason the half adder can't add three ones is because it only has two inputs. Okay, so you see a half adder wouldn't be useful for adding three bits. Anytime you're adding three bits, which you could run into when you're adding multiple bit binary numbers like this. Okay. Well, fortunately, there's another logic circuit called a full adder. And a full adder has three inputs. So a full adder can add like one plus one plus one or any three inputs. Okay. Uh, in fact, this is what the truth table of a full adder looks like. You have three inputs. And often the third input is labeled CI. It also has two outputs, just like the half adder does. And often, the uh, output is or outputs are labeled S and C zero. Can you guess what CI stands for? C input. Say again. C input. Okay. How about the C? What does the C stand for? Anyone guess? Carry. Yeah. C is carry. So this CI would be carry input or carry in, and CO would be carry out. Okay. So since the full adder has three inputs that are binary, right? Each input could either be a zero or a one. How many unique combinations or values can I get from three binary inputs? Eight, right? Again, that goes back to this. This is probably like the third time or fourth time I've written this on the board, right? Two to the number of bits equals the number of values or combinations. So two to the three, eight, two to the four, 16. Remember, every time you add a bit, you double the number of values you can represent with that number of bits. Okay, so I'm gonna have eight rows in this truth field, right? I could have all zeros, zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero. Uh, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero. One, 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 two, four, six, eight. And you see when I list them, I'm putting them in binary order, right? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, notice also these patterns. Like notice the least significant bit of the binary count, it changes uh, every row, right? So zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. And then the next bit uh, changes every, let's see. Well, it goes in twos, right? It's zero, zero, then one, one, and zero, zero, then one, one. And it would just keep going like that if we kept going. And then so this column here, it's every four, right? See four zeros and four ones and be four zeros and four ones that keep going. If you had another column here, it would go in eights. Okay, so there's a pattern to these uh, binary numbers. I just mentioned that because sometimes that's good to know just to double check that you didn't make a mistake and put something out of order. Okay, but now to get the output of the full adder, you're just adding these three bits, right? So of course, if all the bits are zero, the result is zero, right? Then if you're adding three bits and only one bit is a one, the result is a one, right? So zero plus zero plus one is just gonna give you a carry out of zero and an F of one, right? Because we're taking F as the, as the ones column, if you will. Okay, same thing here in this row, our output would be a one, uh, this row also, right? anywhere you just have a single input equal to a one, the output's going to be a one. Uh, any row where you have two inputs being a one, the result is going to be a two in binary, right? So that would make the carry out one and the sum zero, right? Same thing here, one, 
zero, same thing here, one, zero. And then the bottom column, well, that's what we were talking about here. You're adding three ones, so the result is a three, which would be a carryout of one and also a sum of ones. Okay, so everybody see how I came up with the outputs here for carry out and S? I'm just adding the three input bits. Okay, so what you're going to do as part of the activity is you're going to come up with the reduced Boolean expressions for both S and carry out. And you need a K map per output. Okay, so you're going to have an eight cell, you know, you got to come up with the eight cell K map for, you know, output C0. And then output S is going to have its own K map. Eight cell K map. Okay, so you're going to have two K maps that you fill out from this two table. You fill out the K maps just like you've done before, right? That you look at the input and see what the output is for that input, you put it in the appropriate cell. Okay. So, you know, you'll come up with a reduced expression for carry out and a reduced expression for sum for the full adder. Also in the activity, like we talked about earlier, you can get an expression for C from the truth table, right? It's just gonna be an AND gate or an AND expression and also for S, it'll just be an exclusive order. So you're going to end up with four equations, right? You're going to have two equations for your half adder, and you're going to have two equations for your full adder. One of these K maps to the full adder is going to look a lot like this. You're only going to be able to do four single groupings that are diagonal from each other. Okay, so for one of those K maps, you're going to have to do what we did here, very similar. Okay. Uh, let's see. So, do you have any questions up to this point? No, I didn't fill all this up because that's part of the activity. So that would be good practice. More practice with KMAPs. I said, I don't think that's good. Yes, this is the truth table for a half adder. So, from this truth table, when you get the expression for C, and the expression for S, those are going to be, you know, your two expressions for the half adder. Yeah, and then for the full adder, like we said, you got to fill out this in map and then, you know, do your groupings and get your reduced expressions for both those outputs. Okay. So any other questions up to this point? Because the next thing to do, if there's no questions, is I just want to pull down the screen show you the activity. The act, I, I've done part of the activity for you. The, the activity for this class is like prep work for the lab. Okay, but I wanna show you the activity on Canvas, uh, show you the lab two instructions, and then make a few comments about lab two uh, before you get started with it. So is it all right for me to pull the screen down and put the projector on? Nobody has questions about? <laughs> Projector on. Yeah. Probably have to wake up my computer. Okay, so just like the other activity, you know, you just go to Canvas under modules, the meeting number. We're on meeting five right now. So as you see here, uh, the activity for today's class draw a black box diagram for both the half adder and the full adder. So again, Black box diagrams, they just show what your inputs and outputs are. Also a descriptive name. Put the truth tables. Now, I gave you the truth tables, but even though they're up here, go ahead and copy them down. And I would advise when you copy them down, make sure you understand you know, where they came from, especially the full adder. Um, do a K-map now. 
you can you only have to do a K map for the full adder. Like I said, you there's really no reason to do a K map for a four row truth table. So you can just come up with CNS like we talked about, just comparing the output to the inputs. But if you want to include a four cell K map, go ahead. But if you don't, I'm not gonna pick up any points or anything. And then the main thing is coming up with the Boolean expressions for both the half adder and full adder. So again, you're gonna have two equations for the half adder and two equations for the full adder. There's a total of four equations, okay? So any questions on the activity? All right, the lab. Okay, here's the lab instructions, also on Canvas. Every, everybody should know where this stuff is by now, hopefully, on Canvas. Um, but you can see that the activity is this first part of the lab. So you're doing part of the lab when you do the activity. And then once you're done with the activity, now you want to model, you know, build the half adder and the full adder in Bavada. Now what's different, let me put the screen up here. What's different this week compared to the previous week? In the previous weeks, you just had one design source and one SIM file. For this lab too, okay, you're still gonna have one project, but inside that project for lab two, you're gonna have two design sources and two SIM files. Okay, so you're gonna have, okay, say this is your source window. And the bottom, okay, where, it shows your, your file. This week, you're gonna need a design source for your half adder. So maybe you call it HA. And then it's system Verilog, so the suffix here should be um, SV. And then you're gonna need another design source for your full app. Okay, so there's separate design sources. Also, you need to have separate SIM files for each one. So you'll also have, you know, like HA underscore TV and FA underscore TV. Okay. And then when you go to sim one of these, you have to make the one that you're simulating, both the design and the sim, you have to make them what we call the top module. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's this pyramid symbol, like three dots, like that. People notice this. Um, that symbol identifies the top module. Okay, so if you have this to the left of the half adder design source, that makes that design source the top module. Okay, and you got to do the same thing with the sim file. So when you want to simulate the half adder, you got to make the half adder design source the top module, and you also have to make the half adder sim file the top module. And then when you go to sim the full adder, you got to make this the top module, this the top module. And the way you make a file a top module is that you right click on it, and a, and a menu comes up, and one of the options is set as top. Okay. So, you know, a common error is, you know, somebody will want to simulate the half adder and they'll make their design source the top module, but then their sim file, they've got, you know, like the full adder sim file is the top module. So now it's not, your simulation is not what you expected because it's using different test cases on whatever you're trying to test. How many test cases will the half adder have? Four, because there's four rows in your truth table. How many test cases is the full adder going to have? Eight. So you see the sim files are different. Okay, so you got to watch out for that. Um, the other thing is, um, for what you're doing today, you do not need a constraints file. Okay. Um, I don't know if I <laughs> talked about this in class. I know I've talked to individual people about it. But the purpose of the constraints file is it takes whatever you name your inputs and outputs in your code, and it associates it with a physical component on your basis board. 
right? So, you know, you have an input, um, you know, HA underscore A. Well, in your SIM file, you'll assign that input name to a switch. So now that switch is that input that you coded, okay? So where the constraints file is needed is when you go to implement your design and generate your bit stream to download to the board. If all you're going to do is simulate, you don't even need a constraints file, all right? The constraints file is not used until after simulation, okay? So today, if you can, uh, you know, get your design source for both the half adder and full adder and get your sim files both for the half adder and full adder. And if you can get successful simulations for each one of these, on Thursday, you'll have to add one more file, okay? Because on Thursday, you're gonna learn what structural modeling is. And you're gonna learn how we can hook up these adders to do multiple bit additions so they can do a problem like this. Okay? You'll have to learn something called structural modeling and it requires an additional design file. Well, on Thursday, if, if you have this all sim, you know, adding a third file that basically connects stuff up and you know, we'll have to run another simulation for that entire circuitry and then do a constraint file. Well, if you've got every, if you get the half adder and full adder sim by, um, you know, before Thursday's class, I would think there'd be a good chance you can finish lab two uh, on Thursday. All right, if not on Thursday, you know, very soon after that. Okay, it won't be much more if you can get all this um, working before then. Okay? And the answers to the activity are up here. Okay, so you can compare your answers to my answers when you're ready. All right, so do you have any questions before you get started? Because that's the lecture today. Like I said, the lecture today is on the short side. So you have the remainder of the time to work on the activity and on lab uh, two. Okay, and Blake will be here in about an hour.